Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Medicine online webinar series. Today, Dr. Hedge will be speaking about management of knee arthritis. Before we get started, we'd like to provide some user tips so that you're comfortable using this platform. The first 30 minutes of our program will include an informative presentation by our presenters. The last 30 minutes will be dedicated to our live Q&A session. Please note this program is being recorded. To submit a question, please type your question into the Q&A box and click send. Your questions will be seen by others watching this presentation, so please note if you do not want your name attached to your question, please check sent anonymously. Also, your email address will not be shared with any third parties. We will do our best to answer all questions we receive during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can email us questions and feedback to hopkinsseminars at jhmi.edu. At the end of the webinar, we would greatly appreciate receiving your feedback and ask that you complete our survey. A pop-up window will appear at the end of our program for you to complete the survey. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Hedge to begin our presentation. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're here uh, for, to talk a little bit about the management uh, of knee osteoarthritis. And, uh, you know, what we're really going to talk about, we're going to kind of run through the gamut of things, uh, talking first about what exactly knee osteoarthritis is, uh, then going into the symptoms and how we diagnose it. Uh, and then finally, uh, probably most relevant is really how do we treat knee osteoarthritis, ranging from kind of the conservative stuff all the way up to surgery itself. So, uh, you know, before we start, I think it's helpful to get an idea of the anatomy of the knee. Uh, and your knee itself is comprised of two bones, three really, uh, is your femur here, your thigh bone, your patella or your kneecap over here, uh, and then your tibia or your shin bone down here. Uh, and when we talk about your knee, uh, we split it up into three compartments. So we talk about the medial compartment of your knee, which is kind of the, uh, the inside of your knee, the lateral compartment of your knee, which is sort of the outside of your knee, uh, and then the patellofemoral compartment of your knee. And that's the compartment uh, that includes your kneecap and the area where it moves along your thigh bone or your femur. Uh, there are also four major ligaments in the knee, uh, and you can think of the ligaments like the ropes that hold the knee together. Uh, and those are the lateral collateral ligament here on the outside of the knee, the medial collateral ligament on the inside of the knee, and then your ACL or your anterior cruciate ligament, and your PCL or your posterior cruciate ligament, uh, which are on the inside, deep inside the knee joint itself over here. Then this surface here, which is kind of the smooth cushiony surface at the end of both of your bones uh, is what we call the articular cartilage. And this articular cartilage is the lining at the end of the bones that helps the bones move along each other when your knee bends and straightens. And then finally, you have your menisci, your medial and your lateral menisci, which are these C-shaped structures in your knee that kind of act like shock absorbers. So what is the, the kind of definition of osteoarthritis? What is osteoarthritis of your knee? What it basically is, is damage and wear to that articular cartilage cushioning. As you can see in this picture, the articular cartilage will start to thin out. Uh, and you may even get to the point where the articular cartilage is completely lost and you have exposed bone or bone on bone arthritis. And this can happen just from normal wear and tear and use of the knee, kind of like how the treads on your tire wear out over time or the soles of your shoe wear out over time. Uh, it can also be caused by prior trauma to the knee or old fractures and broken bones and things like that. Uh, it can be caused by genetics. So if you have a mom or a dad who's had knee arthritis or had a knee replacement, I mean, you, you yourself or more likely to be predisposed to developing arthritis in your knees. Uh, and then finally, 
patients who have autoimmune diseases, so things like inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, those patients are at a higher risk of having that inflammatory disease affect the joints such as the knee and cause arthritis. Now, arthritis is very common. Uh, you know, 23% of all adults or more than 54 million people in the U.S. suffer from arthritis. And almost 30% of people older than uh, the age of 45 have some evidence of arthritis on the x-ray, uh, but only about half of those have symptoms. That's still 15%. That's still quite a few people. So what are the symptoms of arthritis in your knee? So symptoms of arthritis, you know, first and foremost, it's pain in the knee. Uh, and it's pain that gets worse when you're doing any kind of activity on your knee. Things like walking, going up and down stairs, or even standing on your knee. Patients with knee arthritis also have stiffness. Usually it's stiffness that's worse in the morning or when you first get up. Uh, and then you can, you're able to kind of work out that stiffness as you start to get moving. Patients also have something called crepitus, and crepitus is kind of that crunching or clicking sound when you bend and straighten your knee that you can sometimes experience. Uh, you can also get swelling in the knee uh, and catching and locking of the knee uh, or feelings that the knee can sometimes give way as you're walking down the street. And then finally, some patients can, uh, will notice that their knees start getting crooked. Uh, and your knee starts to get more bow-legged uh, or more knock-kneed over time uh, as you develop more and more arthritis in your knee. So how do we kind of diagnose arthritis of the knee? Uh, you know, the first part is kind of getting your story uh, and listening to your symptoms. Uh, and then the second part, uh, at, which is most telling for us, uh, is an x-ray image. And uh, this is kind of a weight bearing or standing x-ray image of one of my patient's knees. And you see here the knee on the left, you can see the thigh bone here. You can see the shin bone here. And you can see these nice spaces between the bones. And those spaces are actually occupied by the cartilage in the knee itself. And the cartilage isn't dense enough to show up on an x-ray, uh, but it is they're occupying those spaces. But you see on the knee on the right, on the inner part of that knee right here, that that space does not, no longer exists. Uh, and that this patient here, their femur or thigh bone and tibia or shin bone are touching each other right here. So the cartilage in this area is completely worn away. And this patient now has bone on bone arthritis on the inside of that knee. So when you're diagnosed with osteoarthritis of your knee, what does that really mean? You know, I tell patients that osteoarthritis of the knee is something to think about kind of like a chronic disease. It's something that you try to live with for as long as you can uh, and try different treatments to help you live with it uh, until eventually you need a surgery to address the pain. Uh, but osteoarthritis is something that requires a personalized approach to treatment. So every patient has different things that they like to do, uh, and every patient has different expectations from what they need out of their knee. Uh, and based on what people like to do and their expectations, we can personalize a treatment plan for their arthritis to help them get through the day and do what they like to do. And our focus is to make sure that the pain is manageable and that you're able to have a good quality of life and you're happy with where you are with your knee arthritis. So when we talk about arthritis of the knee and treatment, I kind of split it up into four stages uh, and each stage gets progressively more, uh, more involved uh, until stage four, which is kind of the surgical treatment of arthritis. So in stage one, you have things like activity modification. So, you know, patients that have arthritis, it's important that they avoid twisting and high impact activities such as running, jumping, you know, playing basketball. Uh, those kinds of impacts are gonna really cause irritation 
in the knee and cause swelling and pain. Now, you know, the goal isn't to kind of become a couch potato and sit on the couch to avoid activity because of your pain. Uh, the goal is really to try your best to transition to other activities that are easier on your knee. So we encourage low impact activities like a bicycle, so cycling, rowing, swimming, using the elliptical, uh, these are activities that can still keep you active, but will cause much fewer symptoms in your knee than the impact activities. Another important part of this is weight loss. So, you know, nobody likes to hear this, I think, but uh, losing weight can be critical as far as improving the pain in your knee. I tell patients for every pound of weight you lose, that's three pounds less force that's transmitted through your knee joint. So if you less, lose 10 pounds, 30 pounds less force transmitted through your knee joint can be a significant reduction in the pain that you experience in your knee. Uh, and to achieve and sustain that sort of level of weight loss, it's important to do it through a combination of both changes to your diet and exercise. So that may mean going to nutrition counseling, uh, and then focusing on uh, good uh, cardiovascular exercise to uh, <clears throat> burn some calories. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, weight loss is, it's, you just have to have more calories out than you get calories in. Uh, and this can be difficult with patients who have knee pain uh, and sometimes going to a physical therapist to help teach them Extra, aerobic exercises that they can do to help with weight loss that are both upper extremity and lower extremity exercises can be helpful in these situations. And then finally, if none of these things work, then bariatric surgery may be an option uh, for a surgical way to attempt to lose weight. Another thing that can help is a walking aid. So, you know, using a cane or using a walker can help offload that knee joint and transmit some of that weight to the cane or walker uh, and can really help reduce symptoms. So uh, kind of moving on to stage two, uh, I've said physical therapy here, but this is a lot of kind of activity that you can do. Some of it requires a physical therapist. Things like the neuromuscular training requires an assessment and kind of specific guided activities from a professional. Uh, but things like aerobic exercises and strengthening are things you can do on your own. And there are tons and tons of exercises online and resources online that are devoted to exercise regimens for people who have knee osteoarthritis. And then finally, Mind-body practices like Tai Chi or yoga can be extremely beneficial. Uh, it, pain and how you perceive pain, part of it is always mental. Uh, and so these mind-body exercises can help put you in a state of mind that makes the knee pain more manageable and you able to move more freely. Finally, you know, we move on to, to brace use. Uh, I, I'm a little ambivalent when it comes to braces. Uh, I do think they can improve the alignment of your knee and offload the area where you have arthritis and that can help with symptoms. Uh, the problem is, is there a huge pain in the behind to use? Uh, you can see the picture of one of the braces here. They're big, they're bulky. Uh, they can put a lot of pressure on your skin in certain areas. Uh, and so they can be difficult to use on a sustained regular basis or long-term, but they can help. Another thing you can do, especially if you're seeing a physical therapist is have them show you how to do knee kinesio taping. Uh, and this kind of kinesio taping can function similarly to how a brace uh, functions, but clearly as you can see here in that picture, it, it's, it's a lot less bulky than the brace itself. Another part of the second stage of managing arthritis is medications. Uh, and when we look at medications, there's a variety of things you can do as you see on this slide. Uh, but the major workhorse medication as far as reducing inflammation and reducing pain in your knee are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, the NSAIDs. Uh, and those are things like Advil, Aleve, Mobic, or Celebrex. 
and you know, different anti-inflammatories work differently for different people. Uh, so it may be that you need to try two or three different anti-inflammatories till you find one that works really well for you. Uh, unfortunately for those patients, uh, because of certain medical issues like kidney problems or stomach problems who can't tolerate anti-inflammatories, there are some other alternatives. You can take some Tylenol to help with the pain, uh, or you can take topical anti-inflammatories, something like Voltaren gel that you can rub onto your knee. That way it's absorbed just in your knee and isn't absorbed throughout your body. Uh, those things can be much better for people with kidney or stomach problems. Uh, there are also some supplements. So turmeric uh, is kind of a natural medication uh, that has great anti-inflammatory properties uh, and can be really good for inflammation associated with knee arthritis. There's also glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate uh, that you can get at your local pharmacy. Uh, there isn't great evidence that it works, but it doesn't really do any harm. So it may be something that you try. Uh, and if you feel that it's working for you, then you can keep taking it. One point of emphasis I will say is uh, that you should really avoid opioids or narcotic medications for your knee pain. Uh, they're not great medications for knee pain. You know, they're medications that have addictive potential. Uh, and the longer you are on those types of medications, the more resistance you can develop to those medications and more tolerance. Uh, and if you're getting to the point where you're thinking that you need narcotics or opioids for your knee pain, it's probably time to try something else or move up to a, a different stage of treatment. So the next kind of stage is, is injections or shots. Uh, and kind of the first line of injections that we use are cortisone shots or steroid shots. Uh, and I think that cortisone shots are an excellent way to get some pain relief for most people. You know, especially the first time you get it, uh, you can have really great pain relief for months uh, and you can repeat cortisone shots up to every three months or basically, you know, about four times a year. Uh, there are a couple things with that, you know, you can have diminishing returns with steroid shots over time. So, you know, the first time you get it might work great, might work for six months. You know, the next time you get it might only work for three months. And the third time you get it, you might only work for six weeks. Uh, the other thing to think about, especially for patients who are diabetic, is that it can bump up your blood sugar for three or four days after you get the cortisone shot. So it's important to keep an eye on that. If you've tried the cortisone shots uh, and they're not really working for you, the, there's another option, uh, which we call kind of visco supplementation or the gel or rooster comb shots. Uh, you can get those kind of every six months based on your insurance and different insurance companies kind of have different types of gel shots that they approve. Uh, and, you know, it's something that when it works, it works great for some people, but it doesn't work great for everyone. I'd say about half people get really good relief from these gel shots and the other half people doesn't do anything. Uh, but it doesn't really do any harm, so it may be worth trying if it's something that you're interested in. Uh, and, you know, whether it's the cortisone shots or the, the gel shots, you know, shots into your knee are not, they're really not that painful. Uh, I, I tell people it's kind of like a bee sting or getting your flu shot. It's a small poke uh, and really that's it. Uh, it's not something that causes a, a great deal of pain or something to be sort of concerned or, or apprehensive about. Then kind of the last non-surgical treatment that's out there uh, is something called nerve ablation. Uh, and it, this is, you know, we really reserve this for patients who are not really good candidates for surgery uh, or patients who really, really want to avoid a surgical procedure to help with their pain, but really everything else that we've tried has failed. Uh, and it's called geniculate, geniculate radio frequency nerve ablation. And what that really does is we target the nerves that provide the pain sensation to your knee. Uh, and we basically try to deaden those nerves so that you're not getting the pain transmitted from your arthritic knee joint. And it can definitely provide some good pain relief, although those nerves will 
will eventually grow back. And so the pain relief is temporary. So, you know, the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, before we get to the surgical options uh, are PRP or platelet rich plasma uh, and stem cells. Uh, and it, it's something that uh, is increasing in popularity. Uh, and so I did want to address it. Uh, you know, when people ask me about PRP and stem cells, you know, I'm very honest with them. Uh, the science has not really caught up. Uh, as far as what they're trying or we're all hoping that they can do. Uh, we haven't quite figured it out yet. Uh, and, you know, there isn't any real harm in doing it, uh, but these procedures can be very expensive. Uh, and a lot of times insurance companies don't really cover these procedures because we don't really have the science to back up what, what these procedures are doing. Uh, and so, you know, I don't, I, it's, unfortunate to see someone pay quite a bit of money out of their own pocket for something that has a questionable, uh, that questionably may or may not work. Uh, and, and the analogy that I give people is, you know, these stem cells, they're like seeds that you plant. And when you plant seeds in good soil, these seeds grow and, and you know, they make, they grow really well. Uh, and, you know, we've figured out what that good soil is in a Petri dish and we can grow stuff in the lab. Uh, but when you just kind of inject these cells back into your knee, it's not a great environment for these cells to grow. It's kind of like taking a bunch of seeds and throwing it on concrete. The seeds aren't just aren't going to grow there, and we haven't figured out how to make that environment better. And so that's kind of our problem. But trust me, if I knew these things would work, I would definitely use them because it's a heck of a lot easier than doing a knee replacement. But uh, we haven't quite figured it out yet. So kind of the last thing we'll talk about is surgery. And when it comes to knee arthritis, there's really two types of surgeries that provide good, reliable pain relief. And that's a unicompartmental knee replacement or a partial knee replacement, and then a total knee replacement or a total knee arthroplasty. And you can see a total knee arthroplasty on the left here and a unicompartmental or partial knee arthroplasty on the right over here. And what is a knee replacement? What are we really doing in the surgery? Uh, so I kind of think about it like, uh, like a road that's starting to get potholes and starting to get worn down. And at some point that road, you can't drive on anymore uh, and you have to repave it. So similar to that with a knee replacement, what we do is we're kind of shaving off the damaged cartilage that you have in your knee and we're replacing it with metal with a piece of plastic in between. And so we're kind of resurfacing that knee with a new metal surface and a piece of plastic uh, to remove the arthritis and address the pain. So when, when is it time to think about getting a knee replacement? So my, you know, what I tell people is when your knee continues to bother you, on a regular basis and limits you from doing what you want to do, despite your best attempts at all the other stuff that we just talked about with conservative treatment, then it's time to really start thinking about knee replacement surgery. You know, when you're having more bad days than good days, when you can't sleep because of the pain in your knee, uh, and when you're getting to the point where you're thinking about needing opioid medications because the knee pain hurts so bad, that's when it's time to start thinking about knee replacement. Uh, and what I tell patients is, you know, I'm never going to be the one that tells you when you need a knee replacement because I'm not the one experiencing the pain and I'm not the one that knows what they want out of their knee. You know, it's up to you to kind of tell me when you need the knee replacement. And, you know, when your family, you know, your, your significant other or your son or your daughter comes to you and sees you limping around and starts pushing you to get it, that's when you got to start thinking about it. Uh, and, you know, you will really know when you're ready for it more than me telling you. And, you know, I can wait as long as you can wait. And whenever you're ready, I'm ready. So does knee replacement surgery work? Uh, and I think there's a lot of hesitation when it comes to knee replacement surgery. Uh, and it is a big surgery, but it definitely works. Uh, and it's fairly reliably good at addressing knee pain. 
you know, uh, when they've looked at patients who've had knee replacements, about 85% of people are happy with their knee replacement. Uh, and it's, it's not going to feel like your natural knee or you're like your knee felt when you were 20, uh, but it'll, it'll feel a heck of a lot better than what you have now. Uh, and I, I do strongly believe that uh, that 15% of people that aren't happy with their knee replacement, a lot of it is, you know, they didn't really, they weren't really educated before surgery on what to expect from a knee after surgery. Uh, and I think it's important that your surgeon uh, sits down with you and spends the time with you to educate you on what to expect. Uh, and, you know, that you feel comfortable that you understand what to expect out of your knee after knee replacement surgery. Uh, and then, you know, after surgery itself, you know, it is a long recovery. Uh, I tell people it takes, it's a three month recovery and the first month is tough. Uh, a lot of people that first month start to wonder whether they should have had the surgery in the first place. Uh, and I tell people, you're not going to like me very much the first month after surgery. Uh, but once you get into the second month and the third month, things, things start getting a lot better. Uh, and, but the total recovery takes about 12 to 18 months, you can continue to see improvement in your knee for up to two years after the surgery. Another good question I get is that how long does a knee replacement surgery last? Uh, and what I tell people is the failure rate from a knee replacement is about 1% per year. So when they've looked at people who have knee replacements, at about 10 years, 90% of people still have their knee replacement in. Uh, at about 20 years, that's about 80% of people. Uh, and then we get, when we get out past 30 years, there's just not much information out there. Uh, and I think the newer data that's out may indicate that these knee replacements may last even longer as our technology is improving. But a good way to think about this is, you know, if you and 99 of your friends all get knee replacements today, uh, in 10 years, you know, 90 of you will still have good functioning knee replacements and about 10 of you will have needed another surgery to address your knee replacement. And then in 20 years, about 80 of you will still have good functioning knee replacements and about 20 of you will have needed another surgery to address your knee replacement. So kind of related to that is, you know, what is the difference between a unicompartmental or partial knee replacement versus a total knee replacement? So what we do with a total knee replacement is we resurface or replace all three compartments of your knee. That's the inside or the medial side of your knee, the outside or the lateral side of your knee, and the patellofemoral or the kneecap compartment of your knee. Uh, and as a part of this, we have to remove uh, one or two of the ligaments in your knee, uh, the ACL and the PCL, to appropriately do a total knee replacement. A partial or unicompartmental knee replacement is when only one compartment, most commonly the medial or inside compartment of the knees resurfaced. And what that allows us to do is to retain the normal ligaments that you have in your knee. So uh, who is a candidate for a partial knee replacement. Uh, so, you know, the, the main things to think about are number one, obviously you need to only have the arthritis in one compartment of your knee. So if you have very localized pain on the inside of your knee, that's a good indication that you only have arthritis in that one compartment. If the knee pain around your knee is more diffuse, uh, you have it on the inside, the outside, the front, the back, then that's an indication that you may have arthritis in more than one compartment of your knee. It's also important that you feel that you have a stable knee. If you feel that your knee is unstable, that may be an indication that the ligaments in the knee are torn, uh, and that would require you to have a full knee replacement. It's also important to have good range of motion of the knee, so you're able to almost completely straighten your knee and, and bend your knee at least past 90 degrees, because if you can't do that, uh, then you require a total knee replacement because you just need more work done to be able to get that re knee range of motion back. Uh, and then finally, patients with inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, are at a higher risk of developing arthritis in all three compartments of their knee. Uh, and so those patients are not good candidates for a partial knee replacement 
because there is a risk that they're going to need more surgery after that if other parts of their knee develop the arthritis. Uh, and you know, when you look at the number of people who are good candidates for partial knee replacement, it's about 15 to 20 percent of patients who have surgical knee arthritis. So these are x-rays uh, of what a full knee replacement looks like. Here on the left, you can see kind of the full metal piece in uh, your tibia or shin bone and in your femur up here, or thigh bone. And on the right is a partial knee replacement. So you can see it's, it's a lot smaller and it's just this one small area of the bone that's being replaced. So what are the advantages of a partial knee replacement? Uh, you know, it's, it's a smaller surgery and because it's a smaller surgery, it's a faster recovery. So you have a smaller incision, a shorter surgery, less of the bone is removed as you saw on the last slide. And so you recover a lot faster and there's a lower risk of complications from the surgery because it's a smaller surgery than a total knee replacement. The other big advantage is since we're able to preserve the ligaments of your knee, it feels a lot more like a natural knee than your total knee replacement does. Now, that being said, there are disadvantages to a partial knee replacement. And the major disadvantage to the partial knee replacement is that the failure rate of a partial knee replacement at 10 years uh, is about double that of a total knee replacement. So if you get a partial knee replacement, you're about twice as likely at 10 years to need a second surgery because of a failure of the partial knee replacement. And that's typically for a couple of reasons. Sometimes the other parts of the knee can wear out over time and develop arthritis. Uh, or, you know, it's a smaller implant, these partial knee replacements, and so they can come loose from the bone. Uh, and so, you know, when you have arthritis of the knee uh, and you're a candidate for a partial knee replacement, uh, I think it's a very personal decision weighing the advantages of a partial knee from to the disadvantages and deciding if you're comfortable with those advantages and disadvantages or you're not comfortable and would prefer to get a total knee replacement. That's all uh, for this part of the webinar. Thank you all very much for coming to this uh, and listening to my talk. So uh, I think we'll move on to the uh, chat portion uh, and question and answer portion of the webinar. So. Question one, uh, you know, do you see any value in neoprene braces? I, that's a great question. So uh, there is value in neoprene braces, uh, and I think it's very personal patient to patient. The, the value in neoprene braces is people uh, with arthritis sometimes like that feeling of compression that the neoprene brace gives, uh, because that gives a sensation of added stability to the knee. Uh, and so I don't think it it hurts at all. Uh, it's a pretty easy thing to pick up from your local pharmacy uh, and at least try. Absolutely. Uh, so the next question is, I don't have daily knee pain, but after riding a bicycle uphill, my knee aches for days after. Could that be a sign of arthritis? Uh, that could be uh, a sign of arthritis. Um, it could also just be a sign of kind of muscle imbalance. Uh, it may be something to, to get looked at, but because it may be that going to some physical therapy to assess uh, the balance of something like your quadriceps muscle, which is your, your thigh muscles. Uh, and sometimes those thigh muscles, they're strong, but it may be that they're strong differentially. So, you know, your thigh muscle, your quad muscle is made up of four muscles. And if those four muscles are not kind of balanced appropriately, that may lead to pain and soreness in your knee as you do things like bike uphill, uh, which is an exercise that is very taxing on your quad muscle. Uh, so the next question we have here is uh, about the second phase trial for the Novartis injectable drug uh, for lost tissue regeneration. So uh, I, I'm familiar with that. Uh, I think we're all very optimistic uh, as to what it will be able to do. Uh, I think the scope of what it, it 
we're hoping it can do is limited at this point. Uh, and, you know, st a stage two trial, it's very early as far as just making sure that it's even safe uh, for people to take. Uh, but, you know, hopefully as we get more evidence for it and, and we see what it is able to do, uh, we'll see if we can incorporate that uh, into our treatment algorithm uh, for knee arthritis. Uh, so then we have another question is, what's a conservative recovery time after surgery and when can I start driving again? So I tell patients, as far as driving, uh, I, you have to wait at least two weeks after surgery to start driving at minimum, and you have to be off all of your narcotic pain medications. I tell people at that point, when you feel comfortable trying to drive, I advise people to go to an empty parking lot uh, and somewhere where they can test their knee out in a situation where they're driving to make sure that they are comfortable with their reaction time and they can get from the gas to the brakes and react to anything that they may have to react to when they're driving. Uh, and when they're comfortable doing that, then uh, they are free and clear to drive. Uh, as far as a recovery time after surgery, I tell people from a knee replacement, a total knee replacement surgery, the recovery is about 12 weeks, three months. Uh, usually by three months, you're able to walk a mile or two uh, and you will still have soreness in your knee. You'll, you'll know you did that activity, but it's a comfortable activity you'll be able to do. Uh, as far as a partial knee replacement, the recovery time is about six to eight weeks. Uh, as far as uh, another question here, are there any foods to, to avoid? Uh, in general, uh, there aren't any foods I would specifically recommend avoiding. If you have specific food allergies, and that's something uh, that may affect the inflammation and pain in your knee, but that's sort of... Uh, a personalized, uh, personalized thing uh, for you to look into. Uh, so another great question is, what are the long-term issues with getting cortisone shots? So the one real long-term problem with cortisone shots is that cortisone shots will uh, degrade the cartilage that you have in your knee. Now, you can imagine if you have arthritis in your knee, your cartilage is already degraded. So that's not really much of an issue. Uh, so in patients with knee arthritis, there really aren't any long-term issues that we would worry about as far as getting cortisone shots. When you don't have arthritis, that's when we get much more concerned and are very hesitant to give cortisone shots. But patients with arthritis, definitely cortisone shots are, are, are a great thing to receive. Uh, let's see here. So uh, another great question, uh, how does cartilage loss contribute to muscle weakness and why does cartilage loss lead to inflammation? Uh, and that's a great question. And those two questions are related to each other. So when you have cartilage loss, you start to get an irregular surface on both sides of the bone. And that irregular surface, especially when the cartilage is completely worn away and the bone is exposed, causes friction as those two surfaces rub together. And that friction starts to develop inflammation in the knee. When your body uh, senses that friction, its natural reaction is to cause inflammation in your knee. When you have inflammation in your knee and you have fluid buildup in your knee, uh, your, there is sort of a feedback loop that your muscles receive that causes them not to work as well and start to atrophy and develop weakness. In addition, as you have pain in your knee, you are going to start avoiding doing activities because of pain in your knee. And that is also going to lead to development uh, of atrophy of your muscles. And so that's how those two cartilage loss contributes both to knee inflammation and muscle weakness. So uh, after my knee replacement, my knee is warmer than the other knee. Is that normal? Yes, uh, that is normal. You're, the knee that had the knee replacement will be warmer uh, and will be slightly more swollen or larger for quite some time, potentially forever after a knee replacement, uh, but definitely at minimum for the first one or two years. Uh, so what replaces the ligaments removed during a full replacement? So during a full knee replacement, typically your ACL or anterior cruciate ligament is replaced. 
uh, and sometimes your PCL or posterior cruciate uh, ligament is replaced. Uh, and they're replaced by the metal and plastic implants in the knee. Typically there is uh, the way the plastic uh, is shaped and the metal is shaped uh, allows it to simulate the same ligament activity that the ligaments in your knee normally would perform. So uh, another great question is, what is the maximum BMI requirement for total knee replacement and why? So here at Johns Hopkins, uh, the BMI, uh, the maximum BMI for knee replacement is a BMI of 40. And patients above 40, uh, a BMI of 40, we do not perform uh, knee replacements for. Uh, and you know, I understand that for patients that are above that BMI, uh, that can be very frustrating. Uh, but there is a very good reason that we do not perform those surgeries. Uh, patients with a BMI over 40 have a significantly higher risk of complications like fractures of their bones, infections in their knees, uh, loosening of their knee replacement prosthesis, and all of these things would require significant further surgeries. Uh, and so honestly, it's, it's really, it's the right thing to do for people to make sure that they get their BMI under 40 before doing their knee replacements, because it's going to lead to a lot less suffering for patients down the line uh, than doing those surgeries with a BMI uh, above 40. So, you know, honestly, it can seem very restrictive, but we really do it with the interest of our patients in mind, because we want to give our patients uh, the best outcome possible and the best knee replacement that's going to function for them possible. Uh, and if that means more work for us and, you know, making sure that we can do everything that we can to make patients optimized before surgery, then so be it. Uh, so do you use the latest technology for surgery? Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we do use uh, computer navigation uh, for our surgeries uh, and we are, uh, you know, uh, starting to use uh, robotics. Uh, and, you know, we, we as surgeons in, um, at Johns Hopkins, you know, we work closely uh, with, with a lot of the companies that develop implants and uh, do a lot of research into the implants and into to outcomes after surgery uh, to make sure that we're, we have the best practices and, and we're adopting the latest technology uh, that is safe to use. Uh, and that we know will improve the patient experience and patient outcomes after surgery. So, you know, what is the in-hospital time after surgery? That's another great question. So uh, after a partial knee replacement surgery, uh, that's typically a same day surgery. So, you know, you get the surgery done uh, and you're up and you're walking and you're out of the hospital the same day. For a full knee replacement surgery, uh, for at least half the people that we do nowadays, it's a same day surgery uh, where we get people up moving and home the same day after surgery. Uh, for patients who are potentially have uh, some more medical problems or uh, have been, or have a little bit of a harder time getting around, uh, some of those patients will keep uh, overnight after their surgery and then send them home the next day. So uh, another question here we have uh, is my knee bone crackles. How long will it take for me to develop knee arthritis? Uh, it is a bit uncomfortable, but bearable. And then what can I do to prevent knee arthritis? So uh, unfortunately, if your knee bone crackles, you probably have arthritis already. Um, as long as it's bearable, then you know that's good. Uh, the things you can do are not necessarily at this point to prevent the arthritis, but sort of make the pain uh, bearable and make it so that the pain in your knee does not prevent you from doing what you want to do on a daily basis. So a lot of that will be, you know, making sure that uh, you stay active uh, and you're doing, avoiding impact activities, but still doing things like biking or swimming. Uh, if you're having trouble or having a bad day, taking an anti-inflammatory medication or 
a topical anti-inflammatory medication like Voltaren gel. Uh, and if all of these things are still not helping, you know, then coming in to see if you can take a cortisone shot or something like that to help with the pain. Uh, so another great question, can hinge knee brace help with participation in sports activities? Absolutely. So knee braces, uh, and something like a medial offloader or a hinged knee brace, that can definitely provide some stability and help to your knee uh, and will allow you to participate in uh, higher impact or more vigorous activities. And you know, the reason we say to avoid higher impact or vigorous activities is not gonna, because you're gonna do more damage. It's really simply because it's gonna cause more pain. Uh, but you know, if the pain that those impact activities uh, are causing you is still manageable for you, uh, and you still love things like running or playing basketball or tennis or things like that, then by all means, keep doing them. You're not going to do more harm necessarily. Uh, it's just trying to get that pain to be manageable and still do those activities. And a hinge knee brace can definitely help with that. So uh, can arthritis cause stress fractures of your tibial plateau? Uh, occasionally it can. Uh, and it kind of depends on how those stress fractures are being diagnosed. Sometimes arthritis can cause bone marrow edema or swelling in your knee uh, in bones that's diagnosed by MRI. Uh, but sometimes a stress fracture in your bone is a separate issue that may be related to uh, the amount of activity you're doing or kind of any other medical conditions you may have uh, that may affect the strength of your bones. So uh, another great question. I've had a heart attack and have 35% injection fraction remaining. Can I still be a candidate for total knee replacement? So that's a great question. Uh, and you can be a candidate, absolutely. Uh, but you know that's a conversation for you to have both with the surgeon doing your knee replacement and with your cardiologist who's managing your heart. Uh, and you know, as a surgeon who does knee replacements, I would look to your cardiologist to say, hey, you know, this patient has these issues with his heart, but you know, his heart is, is optimized. It's, you know, we've done everything we can do to get them to be as safe as possible. Uh, and, um, you know, once they, a patient is optimized as far as the heart, then, you know, we sit down and we have a frank conversation about how, much their heart is affected and what those risks would mean uh, as far as potentially moving forward with a surgery or not. Uh, but having something like a prior heart attack and a, a lower ejection fraction is just by no means precludes you from getting a knee replacement surgery. Uh, so another great question we have here is, is it okay to do rehab at home or is it better to go to a rehab facility? So. Uh, you know, in, in the world we're in now uh, with, uh, ha, with this pandemic and with COVID, uh, our strong preference is always for you to go home uh, and not go to a rehab facility. Uh, and that's because, you know, staying in a hospital or going to a rehab facility, there are people around you that are sick. Uh, you can get sick uh, and people who go home just do better. That's what we found. Uh, you sleep better at home. It's your, around your family. Uh, they can motivate you and they can help you. And it's a better recovery when you go home. So we always, always, always recommend that people go home after knee replacement surgery. If for some reason they can't, which rarely happens, you know, then we make accommodations for them to go to a rehab facility. Uh, and then once you go home, you know, going to an outpatient physical therapy office to do physical therapy uh, and then continuing to do those exercises at home is what we recommend after surgery. Uh, another great question, will I be able to ride a bike after a full knee replacement? So you absolutely will be able to ride a bike. Uh, and I, I recommend riding a bike to my patients after knee replacement surgery because it's one of the best exercises you can do to recover from a knee replacement. Uh, and I tell people pretty quickly, you know, after about a month, you can, or even a couple of weeks, you can get on a bike, a uh, stationary bike to start uh, and put the seat up pretty high 
And then as you're able to bike and do one revolution, you can start bringing the seat down lower and lower uh, to simulate more and more bending of your knee uh, until you're, the seat's as low as it can go and you're able to bike. But, you know, biking is an excellent, excellent exercise to do, uh, and you can absolutely do it after knee replacement surgery. So uh, another great question, what is bow-legged or knock knee? So bow-legged means that your knees are kind of bowing outwards. And that means that typically you have a lot of arthritis on the inside of your knees. So the space on the inside of your knees has closed down and that causes your knees to bow out. When you're knock kneed, uh, that means that your knees are now going inwards like this. Uh, and typically uh, that happens because you're losing cartilage and space on the outside of your knees uh, and that's, that's outside of your knees are crunching down, causing your knees to bow inwards. So uh, another good question, is getting my COVID booster and a steroid shot in the same week a problem? Uh, so we don't have a lot of great evidence to know one way or another, uh, but kind of the consensus we've come to when talking to uh, the physicians who are researching uh, and looking at COVID uh, here at Johns Hopkins is that it's worth it to probably avoid getting a steroid shot uh, for two weeks after you get your COVID booster and not get a steroid shot two weeks before you get your COVID booster. So kind of give yourself the two weeks before and two weeks after so that the COVID booster shot kind of has the maximum effect it can have as far as helping your immunity from COVID uh, and waiting till two weeks after or getting it at least two weeks before that booster shot. Uh, so uh, another great question, what is a Baker cyst and how is it treated? So uh, that's a great question. So a Baker cyst, when you have arthritis in your knee, uh, your knee's natural reaction to the arthritis is to cause inflammation in the knee. And when you have inflammation in the knee, you start developing a buildup of fluid inside the knee joint. And when you think of a knee joint, it's kind of like a balloon. And when you start to fill it up with more and more fluid, sometimes part of that joint can kind of pop out and cause a cyst where you have the capsule of the joint ha have a little area where it's weaker and then fluid can flow into that weaker area and kind of balloon out. And that's what a Baker cyst is. It's Baker cyst is really a function of you having arthritis and having fluid in your knee. And so typically with the Baker cyst, you know, it'll get larger and smaller depending on the amount of fluid you have in your knee and how uh, the arthritis is affecting you. So usually when you get a cortisone shot into your knee that can address the fluid in your knee and the Baker cyst and that should hopefully help it go down. Uh, uh, and then, have it be manageable for you. And then ultimately when you get a knee replacement surgery because of your arthritis, that kind of addresses the Baker cyst as well. Uh, so uh, another good question, if I'm under 30, can I develop knee arthritis? So there are instances, although it is rare for younger patients to develop knee arthritis, usually it's uh, because of another issue whether it's trauma, uh, if you had a prior fracture around your knee, or you've had a prior uh, significant tear of your meniscus or tear of your ACL uh, that has affected your knee, those patients can develop arthritis early. Uh, also, younger patients with inflammatory arthritis, so patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, lupus, those kinds of uh, uh, medical conditions, even when they're quite young, can develop arthritis in their knees. So that is correct. You definitely can. So another great question. I have advanced medial femoral compartment degenerative disease, but all ligaments are intact. Can you, I be a candidate for partial knee replacement? So you can be a candidate. Uh, part of it depends on your range of motion. Uh, right now before your knee replacement, making sure you're close to straight and past 90 degrees. Uh, and part of it depends on where your pain is. So if your pain is very localized to the inside of your knee uh, and isn't diffuse and you don't have pain on the outside of your knee or the back of your knee, 
uh, then you can definitely be a candidate for a partial knee replacement. Uh, you know, and when you see your orthopedic surgeon, they'll be able to move your knee around and confirm that you are a candidate. So uh, will not need this go away after surgery? Yes, so the goal of this, the surgery in addition to pain relief uh, is we kind of straighten your knee back out uh, close, very close to if not completely straight. Uh, so that knock neediness will go away after surgery. So uh, another question is, can cortisone shots make arthritis worse over time? Um, so cortisone shots can affect the, the uh, cartilage in your knee. Uh, so if you do not have bone on bone arthritis, then yes, it can make the, it can help contribute to the development of bone on bone arthritis. Once you have bone on bone arthritis and the cartilage is completely gone, then the cortisone shots are not really making anything worse because you're kind of past the point where you have any cartilage for the cortisone to affect in your knee. So at that point, uh, the, all the cortisone shots are doing is potentially helping. Uh, another good question. Does a meniscus tear inhibit having a total knee replacement? Uh, so it depends on the level of arthritis in your knee. So patients who have severe arthritis, by definition, have uh, a torn meniscus in their knee. So what happens is, is when you have arthritis, the cartilage surface around, of your knee starts to become irregular. And when you have these irregular surfaces moving along each other, it's kind of like two cobblestone surfaces moving along each other. And your meniscus is stuck in the middle of this. So your meniscus will start to fray and start to degenerate and tear over time. Uh, so patients who have arthritis of their knee, by definition, have uh, tears in their meniscus. Uh, and that is sort of neither here nor there. We don't really worry about that too much. Uh, when we're talking about knee replacement surgery, we're more kind of focused on the degeneration of the cartilage itself. Uh, so uh, what does grade, uh, I imagine this means grade one chondromalacia of the patella mean? So grade one chondromalacia of the patella means that the uh, cartilage or the cushion behind your kneecap is starting to thin. Uh, it's sort of in the early stages of starting to thin, but it has not degenerated to the point where you have exposed bone behind your kneecap. Uh, and, and then sort of the last question, which is a great question, is, is partial replacement only of the inside of the knee? Uh, no. So you can have a, the most common type of partial knee replacement is of the medial or inside compartment of the knee. Uh, but in rare instances, patients can have a partial replacement of the lateral or the outside portion of the knee. Uh, and even more rare uh, is uh, partial replacements just of the patellofemoral joint or the uh, kneecap compartment of the knee. So you can have partial replacements of any of those three compartments. So, uh, all right, I think that kind of uh, is, the end of the question and answer period. Uh, I, I want to thank all of you again uh, for coming to this webinar. Uh, and you know, I hope this has been helpful uh, as far as helping to understand what knee arthritis is uh, and helping you to get a better sense of how we treat knee arthritis and what the options available are to you. Uh, and thank you all for all of those questions. There were a lot of really great questions in there. Uh, and hopefully uh, everyone got some great information from those questions as well.